Good afternoon, everyone. Hope you are having a great time at the I.O. We are here to talk to you about Linux for Chromebooks, also known as Crustini. We'll start by introducing ourselves. My name is Sudha. I'm a designer on Crustini for Chromebooks. Hi, I'm Dylan. I'm the Chrome OS virtualization lead. And I'm Tom, product manager for Linux on Chromebooks. Now, it's the end of day two at I.O., and you've probably already been to a bunch of different sessions that have talked about all the new frameworks that you need to be using or the platforms that you need to be building for. And everyone's right, you absolutely should be. But we're not really here to talk about that. Instead, what we want to talk about is you as developers and how you can get more peace of mind by using Linux on Chromebooks. We give you that peace of mind by balancing simplicity and security. On that note, let's do a quick user study. How many of you are developers in the audience? Wow, that's full room, as expected. Keep your hands raised. How many of you use your computers for anything else other than development, like doing your taxes, checking email? Again, 100% of you. OK, one last question. How many of you are worried about security? Good. That's pretty. I mean, you all should be. So I'm glad to see many hands up anyway. <clears throat> uh, so I don't know about you, but when I start a new project, I, I get stuck a lot. Right? I hit a lot of walls, and I hit a lot of barriers. And I'm like, go to look for a problem, go to look for a solution. And I turn to Google, and luckily, Google's almost always got a great answer for me. Unluckily, sometimes the answer looks like this. And I know I shouldn't run this script from evilsite.com and <laughs> pipe it to sudo, but you know that deadline's coming up. And this, maybe the site looks kind of legit. So in this case, I'll make an exception and I'll do this. And then that happens again and again. And eventually, I end up with a system that I don't trust as much as I should because I don't really know what code I've run on it anymore. I don't have time to read all these scripts. Uh, my solution to this has been to carry two laptops, uh, one for my developer world and one for my everything else world that I want to be secure in. Uh, but recently, I switched to using one laptop. And uh, Tom's going to talk about how I do that. So our goal with Chrome OS has been to give you a simple and secure experience from the start. But if you tried it previously, you might have seen that it wasn't quite ready for developers. In order to be simple and secure, we couldn't run all of the tools that developers need to get their job done. But that all changed at I.O. last year when we announced that we were going to start supporting Linux on Chromebooks. Linux on Chromebooks lets you run all of your favorite editors, IDEs, and tools. And it's now supported on over 50% of Chromebooks including great devices with eighth generation Intel CPUs, like the Lenovo YogaBook C630 and the Acer Chromebook Spin 13. If you haven't seen it, we're going to run through a few examples. First off, how do you get it? It's really easy. It's just a couple clicks. Now, in the background, this is downloading a virtual machine, setting up containers, configuring it all. Dylan's going to go more into that in a few minutes. But for you as a developer, it's just a couple clicks to get started. And this adds a terminal to your launcher. Now, if you open that terminal, you'll see that you have a pretty standard Debian environment. And we've already loaded in a bunch of the tools that develop developers expect, like Git and Vim. And if you need anything else, you have the apt package manager, and you can install whatever packages you need. And if you want to instead install files or install programs via .dev files, you can do that too. This gives you access to thousands of world-class developer tools. Now, once you've installed any graphical apps, you'll find that they all show up in your launcher, just like the rest of your Chrome OS apps. And if you open them, they show up in your window manager, again, just like the rest of your Chrome OS apps. This is the simple experience that people have come to expect from Chrome OS, and we didn't want to change that with Linux. But importantly, this is also secure. You don't have to worry about malware accessing your files, snooping on your traffic, or infecting your peripherals. I'd ask you to trust us on that, but this is way too important for you to take on trust alone. So over the course of this talk, 
Dylan and Suda are going to walk you through the principles behind the architecture and design of Crossini. We're then going to dissect some common developer flows to show you how these principles apply. And finally, we're going to share some tips and tricks for advanced usage for the power users out there. So now I'm going to hand it over to Dylan to talk about the architecture. Good job. <laughs> Okay, so uh, Chrome OS has always uh, had a layered approach to security, and our big layer has always been the browser and the renderer and running all untrusted code in a nice isolated renderer, and that keeps the attack surface of your core system to an absolute minimum. They're not allowed to make a lot of system calls, they can't poke at random bits of your kernel, and that worked really well for web pages, web apps. Uh, however, for developer tools, I need to install a lot of different programs they need a lot of different privileges. They can do anything any app on Linux can do. And that wasn't acceptable for us on the core of Chrome OS. So we needed to add a layer. So we added a virtualization layer. And that lives in the main Chrome OS layer. And that spins up a VM. And now this VM has a much more limited interface while still exposing a full Linux kernel to the programs that run inside the VM. The only way the VM can talk to Chrome OS proper is through a, a small API that that cross VM program uh, on the left up there uh, exposes to the guest. This was pretty good. Now we've got a lot, uh, greatly reduced attack surface. We were pretty happy with this. We wanted to go a little further. So we made sure that the guest VM was also signed by Google and somewhat trusted. This lets us trust some of the actions the guest VM takes. And it's also read-only, so users can only break things so much in that no matter what you do, you're going to be able to boot a VM. However, with all that security solved, we're back in a situation where you don't have enough flexibility. Your apps can't do anything. It's a read-only thing. You can't install anything in it. So we added another layer. Uh, and for this, we stole, used, uh, LXD from Canonical. Uh, that team's been very helpful in getting this spun up with us. It's a pretty standard container runtime. It's built for running system containers. And in our case, we started a system container uh, of Debian and exposed that to the user. So that cross VM layer I was talking about, that's kind of the most important part of the security story here. It's the last line of defense before something gets into Chrome OS. So we went. We focused on this for a long time and made sure we got that as secure as possible. We wrote it in a memory safe programming language. Uh, we chose Rust. This eliminates buffer overflows and integer overflows, a lot of common bugs uh, related to memory safety that are exploited by attackers. We were pretty happy with that. Uh, but we, again, added another layer of security here in that we broke up the virtualization program into pillars and made sure that each pillar that interfaces with the guest only has access to small parts of your host Chrome OS system. So your host Chrome OS system, you've got your bank's web page open. You've got your online tax filing thing open. You've got all kinds of personally identifiable information everywhere. We really wanted to protect that. But we needed to give the guest access to things like a random number, a display, a USB device. So each of those got their own jail, and they can only see the thing they need. So our random number generator can generate random numbers. It can't access any files. It's in an empty file system from its perspective. It doesn't have any network access. The display driver, it can access the display. Again, it can't touch the network. It can't go grab your files and upload them, even if somebody gets into it and tries to make it do things we didn't intend it to. This is all a little complicated, but we've added a great amount of system UI to make this easy for you to use. So when you're just doing your job as a developer, you don't have to worry about these pretty pictures I've drawn for you. And Sudo will show you what we did. Thank you, Dylan. Security is absolutely top of mind for us. While crafting the Linux experience on Chromebooks, we came up with three high-level design goals. The first goal was to keep your experience intuitive. 
everyone here in this room has been using computers for a long time. And you've established your workflows and habits. So basically, what we wanted to do is to match to those, those expectations. We wanted to provide an experience that's natural to you. We want developers everywhere to be using Chromebooks and feel right at home doing it. The second goal was to make your experience native. We could have taken the easy path by giving you a full Linux desktop in a VM, but that wasn't good enough. Our goal was to bring the Linux apps you depend on for development into your native Chrome OS experience. The third goal was to make your experience simple. And I think this is very important. There's a lot of complexity that's going on under the hood. And we want to leave it there. Our guiding principle is that complexity shouldn't interfere with the user experience. There's a couple of things we are trying to balance here. The security concerns that come with installing Linux apps on Chromebooks, and the simplicity that comes with sticking to design patterns established by Chrome OS. And our mission was to find that sweet spot. All right, so now we're going to talk about three common developer flows and see how they work with Crustini. The first of these is accessing files. As developers, we have to do this all the time. Our editors need to access files, as do our compilers, our source control, and a whole lot more. But the problem is that our file systems have a lot more than just code. They have our personal photos, our tax returns, maybe that novel that you've been working on. A lot can go wrong. Ransomware can hold all of that data hostage. Malware can upload your files to some random server. Or maybe you just get something that goes and deletes everything for the fun of it. We built Crostini with those threats in mind to limit what can go wrong. And Dylan will tell you how. So our, our goal sharing files with your VM and with your container was to make it easy for you to get the files you needed for your development tasks where you need them, but not expose things you don't want exposed to untrusted code. Because ultimately, we don't trust the code that's running inside this VM. To do this, we took a layered approach. <clears throat> your files all live in Chrome OS at the very bottom. And we share them out to the VM uh, with a 9P server. We named it 9S. Again, we wrote it in Rust, so it's memory safe. We fuzzed it to make sure unexpected inputs don't cause unexpected behavior. And we put it in a, in a tight jail so it can access only the files you share with it. And it takes those files and exports them to the VM. The VM mounts the 9P thing that's built into Linux. And then LXD takes that mount and exposes it into your container where your development tools are running. The important thing here is that your container can only see files you say, I want to share with my development environment. Uh, your VM can only see those same files. And even the server that we wrote running on Chrome OS can only see those files. It doesn't get to see everything. So somebody exploits this stack all the way back into Chrome OS, they still don't have access to the files you haven't shared with the container. That's a lot of stuff to set up, setting up 9P mounts, bind mounting things into containers. Uh, we had to do this manually for a while when we were developing it. It was painful. So I'll let Suda show you how easy we made it for you. There are a lot of layers going on. But let's see how simple this is in the UI. Right out of the box, you have a directory called Linux files, which is your home directory within Linux. Anything in this directory is automatically shared with Linux. Outside of this directory, anywhere else on the device, Linux doesn't have access to anything until you grant permissions. I'll walk you through a couple of examples here. Let's say you're working on a project, and you see yourself needing files from this one folder called illustrations. To share this, all you have to do is access the right-click menu and click on Share with Linux in as 
simple as two steps, you now share this folder with Linux. If you notice, this is in Google Drive, and that's a cool thing. When you don't want to share this anymore, you can do that by going to Settings and Unsharing. Here's another example where we made quick edits really simple for you. You have a data file in your Downloads folder, and when you double click, it automatically opens in VS Code. When this happens, in the background, it's implicitly shared. And the sharing lasts until you restart. This is the balance of security and simplicity we wanted to bring you. Thank you. So for our second developer flow that we're going to talk about, we're going to look at running a web server. Now, being Chrome OS, we care a lot about people making great web apps, and we want to make sure that they can create those on a Chromebook. And being able to run a web server is pretty central to being able to build any web app. Unfortunately, web servers also need a pretty low level of access, and that can cause some problems. The code that can run a web server is also capable of snooping on your internet traffic. It can know what sites you're accessing, and in some cases, even see the contents of those pages. This means that a malicious web server could potentially track everything that you're doing. Now again, we thought of this as we designed Crostini, and we made sure that we prevented this kind of attack. Linux, uh, Dylan will tell you how. I can be called Linux. It's, okay. <laughs> it's my job. Uh, <clears throat> all right, so starting a web server from Crostini, simple. We've got a good demo over in the web dev sandbox already. Type a command, you fire up your web server just like you would on any Linux distribution out there. What's actually happening under the hood, though, is you're in a container, and you open up a port. That port's in a network namespace inside a VM, uh, running under our special hypervisor, which puts its network stack in another namespace on the host, and then finally out to Chrome. So Chrome can't get back in, which is great for security. You've got wonderful isolation. But if I want to test this new PWA or web page, I'm running in my VM, how do I get Chrome to talk to it? This was not simple. Uh, so for that, we had to add some demons along the way. Actually, every layer gets a daemon for this. There's, uh, the first one is running in the, in the VM. And it's sitting there waiting to check if any container that's running happens to open a port. And then it's got to figure out which container opened that port. And bundles that information up, sends it to Chrome OS, says, hey, this port in this container is listening. The user might want to use that port. And on the Chrome OS side, we say, OK. The other daemon responds, says, I will set up a route to do some forwarding. Uh, I'm going to forward all of this over VSOC, which is a protocol used to talk to local VMs on, on machines. Uh, that's kept under the hood. So either end talks HTTP in, into the daemons, and the daemons talk VSOC to each other. So the key here is that the web server gets to talk HTTP. Chrome gets to talk HTTP. Everything's normal. Everything works just like you would. Well, under the hood, we've got all this extra daemons and VSOC forwarding going, but we've hidden that. Uh, one other important thing, uh, we've made it trusted. So you can get all your PWA features. You can install it to your desktop. Uh, even though it's not technically the same machine, uh, we know it is because we've got the information. We set up the VM. So we allow the to be trusted domain. And all this complexity, I think, makes one of our best demos today of how complicated we made it under the hood and how simple you're going to see it is to actually use. I totally agree that this is very complicated under the hood. But in the UI, it's exactly like you, like you would expect it to be. Let's say you're experimenting with building this cool PWA. Here in Terminal, you're in your folder, PWA Starter Kit. You're running a command to start your web server. And if you see at the bottom of the screen, it's listening at port 8080. At this point, you can launch your browser, go to localhost 8080, and test your web app. On the screen here, on the left, you have your web app in Chrome. And on the right, if you're noticing it, it's in Chrome. 
Yes, you can test your web app on a Chromebook in Firefox, too. If you noticed, we did not prompt you to give any permissions while we were in this flow. This is because the host is accessing the VM and not the other way around. Again, this is another way we kind of balanced the security and simplicity factor we were talking about. All right. For our, finally, for our third demo, we're going to talk about testing an Android app. Now, this is really exciting because just yesterday, we announced that Android Studio is officially supported on Chromebooks. And we even created an installer just for Chrome OS to make it really easy to get started with. Now, of course, Android Studio isn't the only thing that you need in order to build a great Android app. You also need something to test that app on, usually a phone. And while you could do that over Wi-Fi with ADB remote, all this sort of stuff, we wanted to make it easy, just the experience that you'd expect on any other device. I can plug my phone in over USB and test my app that way. Now, if I'm an Android developer, sure, I'll plug my phone in to test my app, but I'm also going to plug in a lot of other devices over USB over the course of my day. I may plug in a USB drive that has a lot of family photos on it. I may plug in a wearable that has some health information. I may even plug in my security key for work that gives me all of my access. Malware can take advantage of these devices to uniquely identify you as you move between machines, to spread itself, or even to make changes to them. Again, we thought of these threats when designing Crostini and made sure that we were preventing them. Yeah, implementing USB was a, a lot of fun for us. <clears throat> Might have been our most painful stack. Uh, <clears throat> same, same principles apply. We've got our layers. We protect the host. There's a lot of attack surface in a host USB stack. It's a very complicated, kind of loosely spec'd protocol. Uh, well, it's an exact spec that's loosely implemented by a lot of people. Um, <clears throat> so we've hidden that, kept that on the host side. Uh, wrote a device that we live in cross VM, jail. Again, we've got a USB driver. It's pretty complicated. It's got a lot of code in it. I'm sure there's a bug or two. Uh, so we made sure it was very well isolated. It can't get to your files. It can't get to the network. It also can't get to any USB device. You have to explicitly say, hey, I want to give this USB device to my development environment. And we've tried to make that as easy as possible. And what actually happens under the hood, we've always got a, an emulated USB bus running. So the, the guest always sees, hey, I've got a USB bus. There's just nothing plugged in. And once you indicate that I want to give this to my VM, it says, OK, I'm going to add this device to this bus. And then we show it to the guest. And then the guest, again, in turn, has to forward that into the container. And the container can see it. Uh, there's two things we were really focused on here. One was security. Again, we addressed that with the jail. And we made sure that the attack surface was as minimal as possible. It's also written in Rust. And it's nice and memory safe. And it's fuzz. But the other issue here is, is privacy, because people somehow use lists of USB devices attached to machines to fingerprint and track users. And we wanted to make sure the untrusted code running inside the container couldn't be another way to do that. Uh, again, this is a lot of steps. Uh, we, we have to create a device. We have to export it to a VM. We have to export it to a container. We have to decide which device to export and not. Uh, and again, we'll have a demo that shows how easy it is. OK, well, this is the last demo. Let's say I'm on my Linux-enabled Chromebook, and you're plugging in your phone. You'll see a notification that prompts you to connect to Linux. At this point, only Chrome OS has knowledge of your phone. Linux doesn't even know that your phone exists. And that's a good thing. If you see here, your phone is not listed um, in, in the USB list. But when you rerun the command, once you connect on the notification, your phone shows up in the list. At this point, you established access to Linux to your phone. Let's say you're working on a project. You're developing a cool app, again, in Android Studio. And you're ready to test it out. You hit Run and select the phone. 
and boom. Just like that, you're able to test your, test your app on your phone. At this point, you can debug and test out your app. Finally, you can go to settings and manage what Linux access to at any point of time. So you can see how security is at the core of your Linux experience on Chromebooks. You, the user, are in full control at all times of what Linux has access to. We take advantage of a variety of UX patterns to make it simple to use and also native to Chrome OS. The combination of principles of Chrome OS and Crostini make this experience pretty unique. Thanks. It's my turn. Uh, all right. Good. We've got plenty of time. Uh, so we've been talking about a lot of details. Um, and I've been talking a lot about layers and jails. And all that's important. And it's a good reason for you to trust our normal flows. And at, when I'm using my Chromebook, I almost always stay within these common workflows that we've polished and made sure work. However, a lot of that technical detail I was talking about is still usable. And we've left hooks in for you to play with it. Uh, so I'm glad I've got time left so I can go through a few of these examples and kind of just whet your appetite for what else you can do. Uh, we don't test this stuff. Uh, we don't support this stuff. Uh, we really want the standard flow to be enough for everybody. But every once in a while, there might be a reason you want to do something a little more advanced. Or you, know, you might just want to go have fun and play with things under the hood. We're tinkerers, right? We're supposed to be. Uh, so we'll go through and, and show how some of this stuff works. Um, all this is going to be from the Chrome OS shell. This has been in Chrome OS since, well, longer than I have. Uh, and so Control-Alt-T gets you a shell. There's a set of debug commands you can run. Uh, we're going to focus on one command, which is the, the VMC command that we added to control virtual machines and containers. Uh, the basic command, you can do a VMC list. It'll show you what VMs you have installed on your system. Uh, the default VM is called Termina. Uh, so hopefully the font's big enough. Uh, and you can see what size it is. The Termina VM is the one that all the demos were done for the slides before. So it's up and running. We've made a shortcut to enter a container inside a VM. So if you want to go into the default container, the container's named Penguin. Again, that's, that's where we were doing all these demos from. So the, there's a VMC container command to get you into there. Uh, we'll pop out of there, and then we'll pop back into just the VM. So VMC start enters your virtual machine without entering your container. So if, if you go back to my layers, it's, it's the one in the middle, the thing that LXD runs in. And the reason you'd want to be in here is if you'd want to manipulate or change containers. Uh, so I mentioned we used LXD. Uh, there's going to be a lot of LXC commands. That's uh, the LXD control program. Uh, this is well documented online. And uh, most of it will work uh, inside Chrome OS, just like it does on a default Ubuntu install. The first one you can do is a list. You can see we've got Penguin running. We have one container. It's up and running. It's got an IP address. So we've got our one container. We might want to play with it a little bit. And before we do, Maybe I want to make sure I can get back to a state where I know it's good, right? Because I've broken them before. It's nice to be able to just go back to where I was and play around without worrying. So standard LXC command, it's called snapshot. And you give it your container name, and you can give it uh, the name of your snapshot. And now you've got uh, an image saved that you can go back to if you break things. This is a uh, copy on write, too. We use uh, ButterFS in the VM, so you're not eating up a ton of disk space. Uh, we can get info on our container. This gives a bunch of information. Uh, again, you can go poke around with this on a Chromebook if you want to. The important bit here is that we've got one snapshot at the bottom, the IO1 snapshot we just created. You can have multiple snapshots. It's got a date on it to help you remember if you didn't use a very creative name. Uh, and then when you want to restore it back, LXC restore. These are well-named commands. They did a better job with this than I did. Um, 
if you really want to go and play with different things, sometimes you want more than one container. So I've got my Penguin container, uh, and I'm going to go, say, install some different libraries in this one. Maybe I want to have a container that's got Python 2.7 and a different one that's got Python 3. Or maybe I want a different container for writing Go than the container I have for writing Rust. Um, <clears throat> so we let you do that. You can create as many containers as you want, disk space limited. Uh, these do, do cost disk space. Uh, the, the most basic way to start off a new container is to copy an existing one. There's an LXC copy command. Uh, the example up here copies the, the default Penguin container over to a, a new container named Kingfisher. You can list the containers. You've got two. By default, containers are stopped, so we have to start them. Now we can list. There it's running. And you can jump in. You say, hey, I want to run Bash and Kingfisher, and now I've got a shell in my new container, and I can go off and install whatever random tool chain I didn't want in my default container. Taking that one step further, uh, we chose Debian because uh, it was kind of the easiest thing for us to do. Uh, we didn't want to tie you down to that, though. We support the Debian workflow. Uh, we support some guest packages that are installed in Debian by default. But some people want to use their favorite distro. Uh, and there is a, a huge amount of distros available uh, from the image server that Canonical runs. Uh, we'll install an Arch one here. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not an Arch guy. I don't really know much about Arch. But uh, some of my coworkers talked me into doing this and playing with it. Uh, so now you can see we've got three containers. And I've got two Debian containers, my Penguin and my Kingfisher. And now I've got something called Arch Test. Uh, and again, I can enter it by telling it to run bash. Uh, and if I want to install packages in this one, I'll use pacman instead of apt. So, look, it's actually, uh, it's actually Arch, I promise. Uh, that's just a, a taste of what you can do from here. Uh, if you go and look at the LXC and LXD documentation online, you can get some more ideas. Uh, there's even some help online about installing other ones and getting them to integrate better with the GUI if you want more than just a command line. All right, so Dylan just showed you a bunch of the really cool tricks you can do with Crustini when you go under the hood. And if you're interested in this kind of thing, we really recommend checking out the Crustini subreddit. Uh, the folks there find features as soon as we release them, sometimes even sooner. Uh, and they're also really welcoming to new users of Linux on Chromebooks. So if you have any questions, please check it out. Uh, and a big thanks to the folks there. So that's Linux on Chromebooks. As you can see, we already support a lot of web and Android developer flows, and there's a lot more to come, both in supporting other developers and in expanding what we can do with new capabilities like multiple containers and backup and restore. We're going to keep applying these principles of simplicity and security to give you the best developer experience possible. Whenever you're ready, we hope you'll join us. Thank you.